Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time before John delivers his last of 12 remarkable lectures to so many of you who've been coming here throughout the fall every Friday afternoon. And I want to give a bit of a tribute and pay thanks to John on behalf of the entire staff of the L Art Gallery. It's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and also a, on behalf of the gallery's governing board, of which he's been a member now for 36 continuous years. John, by the way, was the youngest member of the gallery's uh, the governing board ever elected. Uh, he was a graduate here of class of 1961, where he fell in love at Yale with not only art, but uh, music as a member of the Whiffenpoofs. And he has served this university and this teaching museum in a way few others have ever even dreamt of doing so. So I want to say a few words about that. As a matter of fact, my own coming to Yale was really aided by the strong recruitment effort John put on me when uh, he encouraged me to leave Andover to come here 15 years ago. And when I came here, John was just finishing up, as you know, 17 years at the Getty, where he took on a, a rent of not just a, a construction project of, of some sort, but one of the largest museum building projects ever attempted in America and pulled it off over 17 years uh, before retiring from the Getty in the year 2000. And how propitious it was for Yale that he could then or after attend every one of our governing board meetings in the 15 years I've been here except for one. And very importantly, John came here and really got active with us in the year 2001, which was Yale's tercentennial. And what was extraordinary about his involvement with us is it was a time when we were really rethinking the gallery's mission, the facilities that need to be renovated, these three buildings that we've now taken out of 280 years of combined uh, deferred maintenance, as I think what they used to call it around here, uh, and uh, constructed and opened a renewed, renovated and expanded uh, museum, which is now really known as a great teaching museum. And John was crucial to the work we did in the year 2001, where we literally looked at our original mission statement and thought that it was time to rebalance our great commitment to having a wonderful collection, to not only having it, but to make it really readily accessible and to create an educational mission within this institution that was equal to the quality of the collections. And that, of course, meant encountering original works of art in a really substantial, profound, and in many cases, deep way. And how could you have a better example of that than the series all of you have been, uh, giving, have been given great pleasure to sit here every week and have. I also want to say that uh, John has been a great mentor to our Wordle Gallery teachers. Uh, one of the things we did when we rekindled our sort of teaching mission is we decided to put much more trust in our undergraduate students and graduate students, give them more and more responsibility in the museum for creating exhibitions, programs, teaching. And all of that has been encouraged by John, who's also been the uh, head of the education committee up until this year. So in every way I can think of describing him, he's someone who's given generously of his time and his talent and his treasure in ways that really very few people ever do in their lifetime. And he's also done so in partnership with his beloved wife, Jill, who's here in the audience. And Jill has been so wonderful to let John come our way for so much time every fall, Jill. I know that's not easy to let him run all the way out here from uh, Santa Monica, but you've been great to not only do that, but to come out here and so often be with him and to work in Yale's uh, community garden and be a great part together. So when I looked at his, his uh, title for Heroes, Heroines, and Narrative Paintings. Let's give a hand to the hero and heroine, John and Jill Walsh. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up, John. Jill, stand up. There they are. Huh. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you, Jock. Um, it's a cliche, but the pleasure really was mine. A lot of it came from this audience, which is so attentive and patient <laughs> that I'm, um, I'm grateful to every last one of you. Well, after, <clears throat> after 11 lectures uh, on history paintings, um, most of you know what we mean by the term by now. Paintings 
of subjects taken from texts, myth, scripture, works of history, even novels, plays, generally with a narrative to convey, some part of a story. These were paintings with high intentions, often large, and often intended for public viewing. They weren't made primarily to please the eye or entertain, but to carry messages, moral or religious or political. They often have the capacity to lodge in your brain, to stick in the memory, sometimes as words won't, and recall for you situations that are freighted with importance. As for example, the image of Saul knocked off his horse, stunned, as he's turned in an instant from prosecutor to evangelist. The image of Agrippina, a virtuous wife, with the courage to come and confront a guilty emperor. The image of the gallant British Colonel Small preventing his own soldier from committing an atrocity on the battlefield. In the 10 examples we've used, we've seen history painting at the summit of prestige for centuries. <clears throat> and then, in the 19th century, lose it to subjects that had previously ranked much lower, scenes of everyday life. History painting, though, did not become extinct. Today I'm going to suggest how its values and purposes survived and have been put back to work from time to time after World War I until now. And also how most of its work has been done in other media besides paint. First, here's a painting made by Anselm Kiefer 12 years ago. In earlier lectures, I've worked hard to explain the pictures that I've shown you, but this one I can't explain. It, it has no narrative, but it has everything else that history painting always has had. It, has, it, 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 is, it remains an enigma, but it has great powers of suggestion. I want to draw you into it by suggesting some ways of grasping what the artist intended. <clears throat> the painting is 10 feet wide and taller than any of us, uh, the size of a major statement. In the slide, it's hard to see that it's not painted on canvas, as you might expect. In the original, you see that it's on lead, two thin lead sheets fixed to a canvas. The lead has many things attached to it. In the center, is a plant wired to the surface, a shrub with a ball of bare roots uh, and some branches and leaves. It's chalky white and looks like it had been dipped in paint or plaster, which is breaking off in pieces and has fallen off. Scattered across the surface are a dozen or more little costumes, dresses and smocks and ponchos, baby size or smaller, some of them like dolls' clothes. They're made of metal, partly rust-colored and weathered, stiff, flat, and meticulously sewn by hand. Some of them have bits of white branch under them or sticking out through them. <clears throat> All of this is spread out on a gray field that's spattered with round white dots, some of them the size of a dime, and most of them tiny. They're also black spatters. The spots are clustered together in places, creating lighter or darker areas like galaxies or black holes. In fact, I think everybody reads this speckled background as the night sky, the cosmos. In many places, you see what look like labels, white strips, with strings of handwritten numbers on them, numbers and letters, the letters forming words or fragments of words. Some of them are familiar, like Orion and Tau, <coughs> referring to constellations. Even without knowing the system that astronomers use to identify the individual stars, we can guess that these are copied from official star lists and atlases. And the picture has a label supplied by the artist, painted in large letters on the surface so it 
doesn't refer to the painting as much as it's actually part of the painting. It says, die Ungeborenen, the unborn ones. <clears throat> Kiefer has laid out a whole array of suggestive things on the surface. It's not immediately obvious whether they cohere or how or to what purpose. We have to do the work. And even the words, the unborn ones, are enigmatic. Kiefer has said his titles are, what he says, the starting point. <clears throat> the images should expand the meanings of the words. Other modern artists give titles to their works after they're finished, but Kiefer lets them generate the images. By the unborn ones, Kiefer seems to mean children who are still to be born, or perhaps will never be born. Spirits, in other words, who may come and wear these garments or who will never come because their parents did not live to conceive them. In this painting, um, Kiefer draws on a whole lifetime of reading of mythology, philosophy, and the natural sciences. He looks for the forces in the world that have caused such terrible suffering, especially during his parents' time in the 30s and 40s in Germany. I think, first of all, that these tiny, empty garments suggest an idea <clears throat> that Plato puts in the mouth of Socrates during his discourse with Phaedrus on the human soul. He speaks about the immaterial, pre-existent soul who flies around until she at last settles on the solid ground. There, finding a home, she receives an earthly frame, a body, which appears to be autonomous but is really animated by the soul's power. I think these are what Kiefer wants us to imagine, souls, before they receive a body. In many myths, the world makes trouble for disembodied souls, uh, not just the ones who succeed in finding bodies uh, to inhabit. Kiefer has been interested for a long time in Jewish mythology, particularly the Kabbalah, and he's often turned to the ancient stories of Lilith. In Jewish legend <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, Lilith was the first wife of Adam. She refused to agree that Adam was her superior and was replaced by Eve. <clears throat> Lilith is invariably portrayed as evil. She haunts brides and turns them barren or makes them abort. She seduces husbands and she's a child hater. She appears in literature of the Romantic era, particularly in the first part of Goethe's Faust. You can see her in the middle there with Faust and in paintings by the pre-Raphaelites like um, John Collier at the right uh, with a snake. And even now, Lilith puts in regular appearances in feminist mythography and in online porn. <laughs> I checked that. <laughs> Here, um, Kiefer makes a work with Lilith in the title, scrawled across the top. And it's a frieze of garments, some of them for adults, others for children, abandoned or perhaps never used or never to be used. In the Yale painting, he doesn't name Lilith, but his um, imagery makes the connection. Kiefer has thought a lot about the terrible, unnatural forces in the world that Lilith exemplifies, which are here as a mortal threat to the not yet born. Life and death are central in the painting. Life is here exactly in the center, in the shrub, a young tree pulled up while it was still in leaf. Now it's encased in plaster, no longer growing, and its seeds are dormant. Pieces of its branches are stuck in or under the little garments connecting them. Some years ago, Kiefer read a book and called The Secret Life of Plants uh, by Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird, which came out in 1974, that suggests that plants actually have an emotional life and that they belong to a class of spirit beings whose existence modern science mistakenly denies. 
Needless to say, modern science has not been very kind to the book, but Kiefer's imagination was fired by it. He's also been captivated by the 17th century physician, Robert Flood, who claimed that humans and plants all have counterparts in the cosmos. Now, this is diagrammed here in the microcosm and macrocosm, and at the right, in the tree of life, both attempts to visualize the interconnectedness of all creation. Out of this mix of ideas came a, prog a whole uh, project of Kiefer's uh, called The Secret Life of Plants, uh, a vast frieze of 28 paintings with combinations of some of the materials that he'd used in the unborn, uh, lead, uh, plants, wire, paint, suggesting the universe and connections among its elements. As to the universe, Kiefer has studied what modern astronomy has demonstrated, that it's expanding, that only a tiny fraction of the bodies out there are known to us or can ever be known. The estimated total is 100 billion billion stars. That's a one with 20 zeros. Since prehistoric times, uh, humans have responded to this infinitude <coughs> by observing patterns in the stars, patiently identifying them, grouping them, connecting the dots, and then giving names to the shapes. In modern times, astronomers have constructed uh, a system of numbering, which is maintained by NASA, and Kiefer follows it with a kind of naive care he doesn't stencil the numbers, he doesn't use a computer font. He paints them with his own slightly unsteady hand, laboriously copying them out, as though he were trying to fathom the meaning of the numbers. In this painting, I think you can hardly look at the numbers without thinking about people who were methodically <coughs> registered and assigned numbers for more efficient record keeping. <coughs> and tattooed in the camps that they were sent to, often by unskilled tattooists. Kiefer was a student in the 1960s when more and more was revealed about the whole efficient system of processing and exterminating people uh, that was managed by the Germans of his parents' generation, and highly aware of the, how the silence of civilians had made them complicit and how little they cared to hear about it afterward, and how they denied what they did hear. The mystery for Kiefer and his generation has been, how did this happen? How could a people who were proud of their humanist tradition and their achievements in math and science slide into a methodical barbarity and willed ignorance? Our parents and their parents and their friends say they didn't know what was going on during the war. Well, how could that be? Kiefer's response has been to explore myths. The psychic material common to Germans and all Western people, and to use painting and sculpture to bring forward ancient ideas, not as explanations, but as patterns of being and as food for thought. Kiefer says, people say I read a lot, but in some sense I don't. I read enough to capture images. I read he says, until the story becomes an image. Lilith was an example of that. Another is the story of Osiris, the Egyptian legend of death and resurrection, as told by Plutarch and Diodorus Siculus. Osiris was the god of the underworld, of the afterlife, and also of regeneration, the fertility that comes from the annual flooding of the Nile. Osiris was killed by his brother, Set, and his wife, Isis, searched for the body, which she found, but which the brother, Set, then dismembered. Isis then succeeded in gathering the pieces and burying them properly. Now, there are a lot of versions of the story, but the themes are the same. Death, dismemberment, pious recovery, resurrection, and deification. So, was Kiefer proposing an allegory of renewal? for the Germans' mass murders? No, certainly not, but he believes in facing and exploring every myth that might bear on modern history and cast light on it. 
Well, I want to speak about Kiefer and about how he came to be one of the greatest artists alive and the only one with a full-blown commitment to the traditional purposes of his history painting. Kiefer grew up in southern Germany. He went to, the, went to the University of Freiburg. And after his training as an artist, his formative time was spent in Dusseldorf, starting in 1965, where the dominant figure was Josef Beuys. Beuys had served as a tail gunner uh, in the war and been shot down and went through a lot of what we would call post-traumatic stress and was now a terrifically charismatic figure. He wasn't ever a painter, but he made things and he made installations and he performed. Beuys taught what he called an expanded conception of art, meaning that uh, art for him had no boundaries separating it from ordinary life and was engaged with social and political issues. His performances also dealt with communication in some fairly arcane ways. Uh, in the year Kiefer got there, Beuys performed his celebrated piece, How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hare. Beuys mythologized his own war experience, which he said included being rescued uh, from a midwinter plane crash uh, in the Crimea by nomads. He said they took him to safety on a sled, and wrapped him in felt, and treated his wounds with animal fat. Fat and felt occur in Boyce's work as a kind of reenactment of his rescue and the agents of resurrection through compassion. They're here uh, in this work of 1969 where a VW bus can't help rescue the people in the snow and more primitive methods are needed. Uh, Boyce found these reenactments helped him deal with his own war guilt and heal his psychic wounds. He proposed them to his audience so that they might do the same, with the artist acting as a sort of spirit guide, a shaman, for the health of society. For Kiefer and for other younger artists, Beuys showed how German art could be both modern and useful. There was, for him, adventure and dignity in helping Germans face their recent past and in some way to exercise their demons. In that same year, in 1969, uh, Kiefer made himself notorious by exhibiting photographs of himself giving the Nazi salute in various locations. Unlike Beuys, uh, Kiefer was willing to look inside himself and try to understand how he might have behaved during the 1930s and 40s, how, at his father's age and time, he might have responded to the call, felt the thrill of being in uniform, enlisted in a cause that promised to save Germany and the world. I mean, there's a comic element in it, too, a kind of send-up of the romantic posturing that was such a part of Nazi life. This fascination with your own potential for evil, incidentally, had an exact parallel in the United States in the same year. This is the case of Philip Guston, the American abstract painter, who reverted to his cartoonish early style to paint himself as a Klansman. Guston said, the idea of evil fascinated me. What would it be like to plan and to plot? Kiefer turned to Germanic myth and folklore, to the Nibelungenlied, and to Richard Wagner's use of those stories for good and evil, and to the perversion of them by the Nazis for nationalist propaganda. This is one of the four huge paintings on the theme of Parsifal, the knight Percival he was, uh, of Arthur's round table, um, who's the hero <coughs> of Wagner's opera. Inside a kind of attic with heavy ro wooden beams, some kind of medieval Teutonic prison, you see a stool and on it a bowl of blood, the Holy Grail itself, and the words, Most High Miracle, Redemption of the Redeemer. These are the words that Wagner's chorus sings softly at the end of the opera as the grail is revealed in a beam of light. Kiefer does away with reverence because this is a scene where something terrible has happened. He used real blood uh, to paint the grail and it drips down on the floor. 
The divine light that shone down in the opera is gone, and instead there's just the deadening gloom of some covert location where torture has occurred. Another subject that's more familiar to us in this audience, Hero and Leander. Uh, there's death here, but no resurrection. You recall that Leander drowned while he was swimming uh, the Hellespont to meet with his illicit lover, the priestess Hero. In Rubens's picture here at Yale, his nightly swims were feats of strength fueled by hubris as well as unwise love. In Leander's place, Kiefer puts toy warships, which he's wired to the painted shore. The suggestion is pretty explicit. War is an ancient folly. It arrives with all the irresistible regularity of rolling waves, and it never ends. This is the theme of another uh, Harrow and Leander uh, painting, uh, one that's part of Kiefer's great installation at Mass Mocha in North Adams that opened uh, this fall. Up there, a new building uh, was added to the site uh, here uh, by the Hall Foundation to house three large works by Kiefer. One of them is a building within a building. It's actually shown here on the upper left uh, while it was being seen in London a couple of years ago. And you can just see it here in the bottom inside, uh, a building that contains 30 paintings on the theme of war, most of them having big metal toy-like warships of all kinds come to grief on the shore. The title uh, of the series, Velimir Khlebnikov, refers to the Russian poet and thinker, another of those visionaries like Robert Flood, who searched for systems and unseen connections. Khlebnikov calculated that decisive sea battles recurred every 317 years. To be in that room, I have to say, is a great experience. And it's only two and a half hours away. But you have to wait till April when it reopens. It's too cold now. Kiefer made those paintings and the Yale painting and hundreds more, plus sculptures, at a studio uh, in a former silk factory in the south of France. There, uh, starting in 1992, uh, he created a kind of total work of art to live in and work in and experiment with. 86 acres, 50 buildings or more, with towers and tunnels, uncompleted structures and ruins. I think this has to be the most remarkable artist's environment of our time. It's, by the way, seen beautifully uh, in the film by Sophie Fiennes called Over Your Cities, Grass Will Grow, uh, which has a very good interview, by the way, of, uh, with uh, Kiefer. Uh, Kiefer's now left Barjac uh, in south of France and now works on the outskirts of Paris uh, in a former department sto store or warehouse. And meanwhile, um, he's uh, recently bought an abandoned nuclear power plant in, uh, on the Ruhr at Mülheim, but he hasn't yet announced what he'll do with it. I think the Yale painting is among his very best, and I'll, I'll come back to it uh, at the end. But first I want to say something about what happened to history painting uh, in the early 20th century. History paintings continued to be made and shown long after the whole idea of representing recognizable thing, things um, in painting was put into question by younger artists, by Kandinsky and Mondrian in particular, who came to reject images of anything in the real world. Kandinsky saw a Monet in Moscow as a young man and didn't recognize it as a haystack. He wrote, suddenly for the first time, I saw a painting, I dully felt that the object of the picture was missing. But what was entirely clear to me was the unexpected power of the colors, which had up to now been hidden from me and which surpassed all my dreams. Painting acquired a fairy tale power and splendor, and unconsciously the object was discredited as an indispensable element of a painting. By 1911, recognizable things had disappeared from his paintings. The paintings were now non-objective in Kandinsky's term. 
These are paintings from a seven-year span by Mondrian. And here are the artist's severe words. Every true artist, says Mondrian, has been inspired more by the beauty of lines and color and the relationships between them than by the concrete subject of the picture. The emotion of beauty is always obscured by the appearance of the object. Therefore, the object must be eliminated from the picture. The object was discredited and eliminated by much of the European avant-garde, but it didn't disappear. The last of these Mondrians um, of 1919, um, the same year that this work was voted the picture of the year at the Royal Academy just after the war had ended. The brilliant portrait painter John Singer Sargent was commissioned to make an epic war painting, but he said he couldn't find anything epic to paint. Instead, he produced a panorama at sunset of anonymous soldiers who've been in a German mustard gas attack. The survivors, all burned, some blind, move forward, leading one another towards a medical tent just out of the picture, shuffling through a field of collapsed and helpless and possibly dying men. This is the least known and the last great realistic picture of painting of war. I think it's as desolate, desolate and um, hopeless as any, including the few we've seen uh, by Baron Gros on the left and Ari Schaeffer at Yale on the right. Pictures that depict the participants as victims made equal in their suffering and treat them with unsentimental compassion. In that same year, 1919, a German artist had a different sense of what he might contribute to the recollection of the war. This was the 32-year-old war veteran, uh, Kurt Schwitters, who made these assemblages at the bottom out of bits and pieces and found objects, junk, and framed them like paintings. Schwitters wrote, in the war, things were in terrible turmoil. What I had learned at the academy was of no use to me, and useful new ideas were still unready. Everything had broken down, and new things had to be made out of the fragments. For Schwitters, there was no narrative, not even any pictorial response that could be made from the stupidity and the horror and the disgrace uh, of the war. History painting was left behind by the avant-garde, and its reappearances were mostly in service of governments wanting to instruct the population and ins ensure their loyalty or for dissidents to do the same thing. The model we know best is the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. But just before Stalin, uh, advanced artists had enlisted in the revolution, wanting to build a better society and communicate messages of solidarity and faith in the future. Uh, El Lysitsky's poster on the right puts the Bolshevik insurgency, insurgency in graphic terms. It, it, it's the words say, beat whites with the red wedge, the sharp edge of the masses, in other words, who split apart the whites of the Karensky government. Tatlin designed the ultimate idealist monument, a kind of socialist Eiffel Tower spanning the Neva River, uh, housing the new government in three suspended buildings that each were to rotate at a different rate. If it had actually been built. But under Stalin, artists were put to work on more practical jobs. Modernism, especially abstract art, was seen as a feat, and what was needed was realistic depictions of history that would legitimate state policy, and the Soviets needed heroes. Lenin died in 1924, and under Stalin, he was virtually deified. Uh, the picture on the left is a life-size painting that, which the artist shows him in the most turbulent moments of the new socialist regime, alone in a plain room at headquarters, calmly mapping out the future of the people. Painters under Stalin were directed to reconstruct historical episodes that supported the official line. Such is the legitimacy of the Soviet absorption of independent states 
and the solidarity of the people, especially the remoter and more rebellious, like the re Ukraine. This huge painting of 1950 uh, shows Ukrainian Cossacks celebrating their tr treaty with the Tsar in 1654, intended to remind the modern public that the Ukrainians are legally bound to Russia, a point that was naturally fiercely contested during the post-war period. The communist Chinese inherited this style of propaganda from their Soviet allies, uh, rewriting or inventing events, events in the past and encouraging her hero worship. Uh, Mao Zedong here is portrayed as relentlessly active, rosy-cheeked, omnip omnipresent. And of course, in the landscape, there are gushing irrigation canals and abundant crops and happy workers uh, and even electrical towers and on the road in the foreground the treads of a tractor. Who could say that people were starving? This was painted in the year of utter catastrophe for collective farming and backyard steel production uh, and Mao was preparing for the launch of the great proletarian cultural revolution. Then there's Le Feng an orphan uh, who joined the Red Army, served faithfully, and died at 21. And not much else is known about him. The Chinese propaganda machine created a legend out of his unselfishness, his cheerfulness, his total loyalty to Mao's thought. He was made into the model youth. Even now, Le Feng Day is celebrated throughout China each year, officially, especially in schools, but I read that skepticism about all this um, among educated parents is growing. For eight years during the Depression, our government sponsored a work program uh, for artists who produced murals for public buildings all over the country, most of which were in the tradition of history painting, some uh, depicting historical events. Progress and productivity were, of course, the big themes. The picture on the top is interesting not for its subject that's early mail service, or its neo-Renaissance style, but for the fact that it's by Philip Guston, who became a major abstract expressionist at 20 years later, you saw him before, and reverted to his own brand of cartoonish figurative painting. Underneath is a mural by an artist whose biography I'm afraid I don't know, but the picture is in a school a few miles from here in Fairhaven, it's Fairhaven High. It shows the laying out in 1639 of New, ha New Haven's famous nine square grid plan, the first such city plan uh, in the colonies. You see some of the settlers uh, and a group of Quinnipiac Indians who sold them land. And in the distance, there's the only natural landmark then as now, East Rock. The WPA murals project was inspired partly by painting in Mexico after the revolution of 1910. Uh, beginning in 1922, well-traveled, politically-minded, educated artists got public commissions to commemorate Mexico's history. This is Diego Rivera, uh, who developed a kind of neo-primitive style, evoking Mayan reliefs in their flatness and stylization, and used it in large frescoes. This one of armed struggle by citizens uh, is part of a cycle in the Ministry of Education. And Rivera includes his friends uh, and his wife, Frido Kala, or Kala wearing uh, red, uh, handing out rifles. The Mexican's uh, faux naïve style in painting was a, a claim to innocence, you could say, and authenticity that's common to other artists' political subjects for a long time to come. We'll come back to that. The best known history painting painter and painting uh, of the 20th century uh, is, his, is the best known painter, uh, that is uh, the artist uh, of this universally well-known work. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, the fascist insurgents led by General Franco asked their German allies to bomb and strafe the unimportant Basque town of Guernica, about 15 miles from Bilbao which is evidently to intimidate the civilian population, which sympathized with the legitimate elected government of Spain, the Republicans. The Germans obliged with dime, dive bombers and uh, fighter planes, 
and hundreds of civilians were killed. During the next couple of months, Picasso painted this act of protest, 26 feet wide, which was shown by the Republican government here at the World's Fair uh, in Paris in 1937. And afterward, it went on an international tour, was lent to the Museum of Modern Art for many years, until it finally returned to Spain. Picasso doesn't picture bombing or strafing. It's just the human horror and animal anguish of the subject. The horror comes not only from observing our fellow beings in pain, but also for, from perceiving, I think, that the world we knew was shattered by this event, an act of pure machine age terrorism. Picasso forgoes color and substitutes the non-colors of the event as Picasso and the rest of the world experienced it in the black and white of newsreels and newspapers. He shatters ordinary experience and disassembles them, distorts them, and reassembles them into something terrible and new. But unlike other great history paintings, this one is highly organized. I said unlike, but like other great history paintings. This one is highly organized, pulled together uh, into a tremendous broad-based pyramid of light that seems to spill in from somewhere above and behind, not the light of grace or enlightenment, but the stark light of annihilation. This is a picture that's made trouble ever since it was first shown. It served first as an accusation of Franco's regime, then as a banner for Basque retaliation, then as the prize exhibit at MoMA in New York, and then finally as the object of a long negotiation by Spain to get it back to serve as a symbol of its post-Franco democracy. Here's a story that suggests the power of Guernica and our inability to learn its lessons. There's a tapestry copy of it that's hung for years at the United Nations building in New York. In February 2003, the Bush administration was arguing at the UN that Iraq should be invaded, and General Powell was going to give a press conference in the room where the Guernica tapestry would have appeared in the background. <laughs> Our representatives had a blue curtain placed over it so as, so as not to complicate the imagery on the camera. The TV audience never saw the tapestry. And two months later, Baghdad was bombed for nine days and about 2,000 people were killed, most of them civilians. I want to show a few works by contemporary artists who have made recent history and social injustice their themes, and have often worked on a large scale. Uh, in our time, uh, the most uh, remarkable visual history of a people was made by Jacob Lawrence, who pictured the great black mi brick migration from the farms of the south to the cities of the north in 60 paintings that are now divided between MoMA and the Phillips Collection in Washington. The pictures are small, but the project amounts to an epic. The episodes are treated in a kind of lively, concise way, flat, schematic, collage-like, with some witty references to ancient art, the cotton pickers, for example, uh, who bend over like Egyptians in ancient wall paintings. Lawrence uses a kind of practical common sense cubism with colors that go from cheerful to gloomy depending on the subject. From the 1960s on, the Chicago artist Leon Golub painted enormous scenes of official violence, like this one from a series of mercenary soldiers and their victims, painted on an unstretched canvas 20 feet wide. Golub said, you need a public art to deal with power and corruption to deal with the implacable, and to deal with, with survival. Well, you can't tell what country these strutting, uh, jokey, hired guns work for. But now, uh, 30 years later, we realize it could be any country, including our own. Golub takes images from macho magazines like Soldier of Fortune and paints them as flat cutouts, with their surfaces scraped down raw. The Blood red walls are, kind of are calculated to make your skin crawl. Golub's wife and collaborator of 50 years was the artist and feminist 
Nancy Sparrow, and although she wasn't strictly a history painting, she was painter, she was conscious of literature and history, and like Golub, she was portrays the anguish and occasional joys of oppressed people. Uh, she made public art for the most part, not much that collectors could or would hang on their walls, and it's purposely unartful looking, like this frieze of aspiring women running around on the floor of a gallery, or the marvelous uh, mosaics that you see on the walls of the subway tunnels at Lincoln Center. The South African artist William Kentridge doesn't paint, but he makes large, powerful drawings that he uses to make short animated films in black and white intended to be seen in museum galleries. They're wordless, and the action is fluid. Here, here a rich real estate developer uh, is in the hospital uh, being examined uh, by a crowd of pinstriped men just like him. Hospital scenes are intercut with images of the man driving, hitting a black man, and leaving him for dead. The main complaint of the title here is his guilt, and we see the sources of that uh, in his brain scan, uh, which shows the dead victim and various pieces of the man's office equipment with which he's made his money. It's all a lot more elusive and witty than I'm making it sound. It's about self-examination and about taking responsibility, the great themes of South African life after apartheid, during the time of truth and reconciliation. This has something in common, I think, with Kiefer's uh, painting, The Unborn, despite the differences in technique. And just, by the way, you'll all want to um, see Kiefer's, uh, I mean, uh, Kentridge's immersive uh, one gallery installation at the Met uh, called The Refusal of time, which is just fairly recently open and closes in mid-May. Uh, Kara Walker um, is a 44-year-old American woman who has had an international success with installations that deal with slavery, miscegenation, racial stereotypes, male fantasy, and the codes of the Old South. Like Kentridge, she's a essentially a public artist working on a large scale without painting at all. Instead, she makes life-size paper silhouettes, a 19th century art form mainly practiced by women, and puts them on the wall as though they were episodes of a story. They're perversely decorative and often very undecorous, explicitly sexual. They put a skewer through the dream material of Southern gentility, uh, the theme, by the way, of uh, Steve McQueen's great movie, 12 Years a Slave, still showing, which is the kind of serious film that for a long time has been doing the work of visual narrative that history paintings painters used to have to themselves. The pioneer video artist Bill Viola made his reputation in the 70s and 80s with montage of video footage that had no clear storyline, but for the past dozen years he's been staging pieces that have narratives played out in slow, slow motion projected on a large screen sometimes, or run on small, flat video monitors. Uh, this is a piece called Emergence uh, in Yale's collection. It runs about 12 minutes and opens with two women in vaguely biblical clothes, waiting by a wellhead that looks a bit like an altar. After three or four minutes, water starts spilling out, and a deathly pale young man slowly rises from the water. The water gushes out as he rises higher, and very slowly he collapses into the arms of the women, suddenly looking like a high Renaissance painting of the deposition. They lower his lifeless body, perhaps a son, possibly a husband, and they cover him with a shroud. The piece is visually mesmerizing, gripping, and it's a conundrum. How does he rise? Why does the water spill out? Is this birth? Is it death? Is it both? Recently I saw a video installation that I think is important enough to belong in this company. The artist is Yael Bartana, a young Israeli woman who works in Berlin and Tel Aviv. It consists of three videos that you see in separate galleries, each running ten to eight to ten minutes or so as you go from one room to the next. 
It's a fable uh, in three chapters about a fi fictional youth movement in Poland intended to repatriate Jews who've left the country and led by a charismatic young man who's a brilliant orator. In the first room, he's in, a, in an abandoned stadium addressing Jews wit witnessed um, by a group of, of kids in scout uniforms who form a kind of troop. Next, in the second, young people of the movement are building a small uh, kibbutz uh, near Warsaw, in Warsaw, uh, where Polish is being taught to the Jews who have returned. It's an enclosure with wooden walls, uh, which gets a tower, and then at the end, um, some barbed wire, a flag with a vaguely familiar insignia. It has all the surging uplift, the stirring music of a well-made propaganda film of the 30s, and the enclosure looks more and more like a camp. In the last room, the charismatic leader has been assassinated, and a vast state funeral is held, complete with a colossal statue of the young man. There's more, but um, in less than 30 minutes, you see the rise and flowering and perversion of an idealistic movement with all of its emotional pull, its ambiguities, the incredible sexiness of the images, and of course, unseen dangers. Here I want to mention a form of contemporary narrative by artists that's neither painting nor film nor video, but it's related to all of them, the graphic novel. It's the grown-up child of comics, and during the past 30 years, it's reached maturity as it's turned to modern history. Uh, this most influential of these is the series published in Japan serially starting in 1973. The hero is a brave and cheerful boy called Barefoot Gen. The plot follows his experience and that of his family in Hiroshima before and during and after 1945. It's a subtle, complex story, not a simple morality tale, and it's told in a strong and inventive way visually that exposes many a Japanese taboo along the way, like the cult of the emperor and conflicts between social classes. This one was, was one of the first of the mangas or graphic novels that was translated into English, and it's had a big influence in the United States. This is the graphic novel uh, by Art Spiegelman that won the Pul Pulitzer Prize in 1991, and it's been translated into 30 languages by now. I think it's still the richest and the subtlest of all. It began uh, with a strip like uh, the um, uh, like the Barefoot Gen uh, in 1972. Spiegelman was at the time was a leading figure in the underground comics movement, which took on serious subjects and, after quite a struggle, lost most of its funny paper associations and morphed into the so-called graphic novel. Mouse is about one family's experience of genocide and its effects. Uh, Spiegelman interviews his father about his experience at Auschwitz, making the various races and nationalities into animals of various species, mice for the Jews, cats for the Germans, and so on, the kind of parody of stereotypes. Uh, these books, in two volumes, are in print, and I recommend that you get them. I've been dealing with artists who are not painters, who have made pictorial narratives of historical events. Let me take, as I close, a few minutes uh, for an episode of genuine history painting, the mythical subjects of the painters who became abstract expressionists, Pollock, Rothko, Gottlieb, Newman, and others, uh, in the late 1930s and 40s. Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko were deeply involved with mythology and were, by some definition, history painters for a while. Uh, they both came from the surrealism of the 1930s and its preoccupation with the psychic forces that shape our dreams, uh, often into distorted forms. They were both interested in the teachings of Carl Jung, who, like Freud, showed how dreams could reveal buried truths, and especially Jung's concept of a collective unconscious, that we inherit the same psychic structures that give rise uh, to recurring patterns, so-called archetypes that appear in our own lives and in myths and folk tales and in connect all humans. For Pollock, uh, it was the wolf, uh, an archetype for 
the fearsome and the life-giving, embodied in the story of Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, and their nurturing by the surrogate mother Lupa. At the right, uh, Rothko uh, seized on the myth of Leda, uh, who had a sexual encounter with a swan, who was Jupiter in disguise. Neither artist was telling a story. Both were putting their inner lives into paint, impulsive, vehement in the case of Pollock, calmly surreal uh, in the case of Rothko. Here's another Lida by Cy Twombly. In among the ferocious scribbles that suggest a struggle, a phallus appears, and out of that fury float a couple of hearts. Twombly painted at least six paintings with this title of six Lidas, all different, but all full of agitated lines. What he evidently thought of as an expression of erotic energy and resistance to it. Still farther, farther from historical narrative is Barnett Newman's enormous painting in the Museum of Modern Art. Five lines of just different colors on a field of intense red. Newman was the oldest of the abstract expressionist group and the one who was most anxious to define his relation to the learned tradition and elevated ideals of history painting. He often used biblical titles, but this one he seems to have made up. Vir heroicus sublimis, man heroic and sublime. I want to read a bit of Newton, Newman's writing just to remind you of the grandiosity of these artists' ambitions. Uh, this is from 1947. This is uh, Newman writing. We are reasserting man's natural desire for the exalted, for a concern with our relationship to the absolute emotions. We do not need the obsolete props of an outmoded and antiquated legend. Instead of making cathedrals out of Christ, or man, or life, we are making it out of ourselves, out of our own feelings. The image we produce is the self-evident one of revelation, real and concrete, that can be understood by anyone who will look at it without the nostalgic glasses of history. The art of our time will be remembered for doing without the glasses of history, whether in principle or in pride or in ignorance. But I don't want to give the impression that I'm identifying virtue or accomplishment in art with history painting. Our era has opened up new territory for artists and their audiences. For me, personally, the richest territory has been work by artists who invite us to observe and explore our own visual sensations, mostly stripped of imagery and associations, and have changed our role from passive onlookers to participants. Some of these works can induce sensations of awe and even transcendence. As you move within them, they can plant images in your mind that you don't forget. Let me just talk for a moment about this famous example. In the middle of South Texas rangeland, you get to the town of Marfa and a couple of hangar-like army buildings adopted for a permanent installation by the New York artist Donald Judd. There are a hundred chest-high boxes with matte aluminum surfaces, all the same size, but with interiors that are configured differently. Your first impression is of a lot of geometry, a lot of metal, everything fixed in place. But after you move around slowly and relax and observe, you become aware of the whole envelope of light around you. You see the interplay of shadows and reflections on and inside the boxes and between the boxes and the grasses and the sky outside and the subtle colors of light changing all the time. Everything that seemed fixed, uh, everything that seemed fixed and solid at first is in flux, it seems even immaterial. The boxes invite you to figure out their geometry, and it's often hard to tell by looking. The whole experience is decentering. What seemed to be sleek, 
soulless arrangement of man-made things takes on life. The appearance of everything changes as you move, as the grasses move, as the sun moves. The appearance of one thing is conditioned by light and color from something else, near or far. It's about contingency. It's about interrelatedness. And it requires your full attention. If you give it, you're rewarded for it, not just by pleasure, but with metaphors for the real world. You return to that world more alert, more open, even with a sense of new possibilities for yourself. I'm going to return to Kiefer <coughs> via two European contemporaries whose work includes images intended to make us think about recent history and how we respond to it. Gerrit Richter's experience has been different from Kiefer's. He's half a generation older. He grew up in Dresden, where he was 13 when the city was bombed by the Allies and mostly destroyed in the horrendous firestorm that killed about 25,000 people. When he painted this 18 years later, he turned to a documentary photograph. We don't see the devastation as we do in Guernica. We see the bombers doing their jobs, methodically dropping some of the 3,900 tons of bombs and incendiary devices. Technology allowed the pilots to stay remote from the consequences of their acts. And photography provided a black and white image. So Richter takes the event to another remove and bases his painting, his gray and white painting, on the photograph. The effect is something of a memory. It's, 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 the effect is like the memory of an ev events that we didn't actually witness, but we know only through the media, just as Picasso did with the bombing at Guernica. Richter takes an actual image and makes it flat, colorless, faded, remote, cool. There's a similarity to a picture done in the same year, 1963, by Andy Warhol, which is also a banal, artless image of a terrible subject, death by machine. Warhol might have said of this, the picture doesn't care. But is Richter's attitude ironical? Richter said, by way of reporting, these paintings will contribute to an appreciation of our time, to see it as it is. Our time, what is that? Not 1945, I assume, but now, when history is mainly what photojournalists have captured and what their editors choose to, chose to, ran, to run. Now when we're able and willing to stand away from terrible events. This is part of Richter's series of 15 paintings called 18 October 1977. That was the date that it was discovered that three leaders of the Bader Meinhof gang, uh, a terrorist group who were being held in prison, were found dead in their cells. Suicides, according to the official report. Richter used published photographs to paint fuzzy, degraded pictures that embody the legend of these bright, idealistic, even glamorous young people who became killers and outlaws for a cause. Richter presents them not as martyrs, certainly not as heroes, but as people whose real selves he doesn't presume to represent and can't be known, despite the millions and millions of images of them. Richter painted a remembrance of September 11th, 2001, four years ago, after the event at the in invitation of the Museum of Modern Art. It's a recollection of history with a dreamlike quality. You can see something of the towers and you see billows of smoke that seem to gather at the top and blot out everything. <clears throat> you see some broad horizontal brush strokes or almost squeegee marks rapidly drawn across the surface. They seem to lie on top of another layer as though we were looking through glass that had been smeared. This is Richter's distancing again between us and direct knowledge of the event. Between those, there was the TV screen and the pall of smoke and the vagueness of the artist's image, and now the abrasion that he's performed on what might be a glass window, marked as if by somebody who didn't want to see. By picturing events, Richter embraces them, but by the way he pictures them, he avoids their actual horror. 
A couple of years ago in New York, you may have seen Christian Boltanski's installation called No Man's Land. It was a two-story pile of clothing and a crane with a claw that regularly lifted up a huge bunch of clothes and let them fall again. You had to walk around a huge mm. bank of rusty cookie tins at one end, each one numbered like a file box containing who knew what, perhaps some belongings of people who were wore or would wear those clothes. You walked among carefully marked out rectangles, each of them brightly lighted, with clothing spread out on the floor. There was a soft, steady, uh, steady kind of thudding sound uh, in the air that you realized was a heartbeat. The imagery was something like Kiefer's, but explicit, perhaps unnecessarily explicit, ex enveloping on a grand ceremonial scale in a military building now desanctified and functioning as a museum. And going there felt like a public ritual uh, of recollection. Kiefer transforms images into materials by hand. He makes a cosmos out of spots and spatters of paint on a ground of lead. Lead is that it's the, the base metal of alchemy. It's capable of being turned into gold. Kiefer said about lead, it is like us. It is in flux. Lead is material for transformation. It's also a material that blocks radiation, such as the waves that reach us from the stars. Seems paradoxical, but Kiefer says, I work with the concept that nothing is fixed in place and that symbols move in all directions. Kiefer is one of the rare artists who brings into our own time almost every element of history painting, scale, sources in literature and myth and religion, and seriousness of purpose. I said almost because he doesn't tell stories. Instead of narratives, he proposes associations. And he gives us the job of pondering those and working out for ourselves a better sense of history. In this case, especially of German aggression and s savagery, of denial, and the materialist culture that is served as a painkiller, and the many subsequent repetitions of that pattern in our own time. In the context of contemporary art today, Anselm Kiefer is extravagantly learned. He reads and thinks and writes. He synthesizes poetry and myth and history. And he believes deeply in the benefits we gain by following him and making the effort to exercise our own imaginations. His seriousness makes some critics impatient or embarrassed. And although he's had a huge success selling his work, he couldn't be more out of step with most of the art world, which demands more entertainment than he provides, which rewards the self-referential and the trivial, which thrives on auctions and fairs and competition, exploits mass production, and makes the rich richer. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Kiefer has a large following of people who see that important matters are at issue in his paintings, which they do well to think about. And they take the trouble to make themselves familiar with Kiefer's points of reference, just as we've been doing this fall with the history paintings we've discussed, going back to the stories, learning from the images, and making them ours. In the future, I wonder, is there going to be a public for art made up of people prepared to do some work? I'll let that question hang there. And I'll give the last word to Kiefer, the artist who provokes the question. Recently, Kiefer has brought out a little watercolor he made when he was 30 at the North Cape in Norway, at the northernmost extreme of Europe, where the sun dips down towards the horizon at midnight, but doesn't go under, and then rises again. What he wrote on the top of the drawing can be translated as, art doesn't quite set. Recently, he's used the image in a book, and for the title of the book, he paraphrased the idea, art 
will survive its ruins. May that come true. Thank you.